Hi, today we're at the offices of JAC in Kentish Town, North London, with Stuart Nassos and Elaine Glass. So I'm Stuart Nassos and I'm Chief Operating Officer for the Jack Travel Companies. I'm Elaine Glass, I'm the Director of HR. So tell me, how do you attract staff to your company? What benefits do you offer? Um, the usual benefits um, we offer in terms of uh, generous holiday allowance, pension, uh, private medical insurance, depending on seniority, um, and also depending on where the person is based throughout, um, throughout the globe. So, for example, in Romania, uh, we offer free lunches to, to everybody. But besides those sort of normal kind of standard benefits, um, one of the things that we feel very strongly about is making sure that um, people are, are really caring for their lives outside work as well as within work. Uh, so things like flexible working is really important to us. We uh, discount our hotels so that people can have a little bit of time away. Um, and also we give everybody their birthday off. So we tell them, put their feet up on their birthday and, and, and have your birthday off. Uh, besides that, obviously you've seen there's a lot that goes on in the office, so we have uh, regular um, lunches that take place. Um, because we've particularly, particularly recently we've hired a lot of new people uh, into the company, so we have a sort of get to know your, get to know your colleagues lunch uh, about once a month now in the London office. But also, I mean, lots of social activities, so summer parties, winter parties, barbecues, Halloween. Easter, so in Easter egg hunt, uh, we would usually have lots of different things in that uh, in that sense to attract people, and otherwise a kitchen. So there's a you know a, a really nice vibe that goes on in lunch at lunchtime with everybody kind of coming into the kitchen, and things like. Um, Competitions. So we had a competition, um, and you'll see around the office that there's lots of photos um, on on our walls, and they are all photos from our employees. So we had a competition uh, to select the best photos, and then we framed them and put them around the offices. Anything that we can think of, really, to to get people together. What do you look for in a CV or application? The very first thing that we look for really is experience. So we want to know that um, the person, uh, in terms of their experience, matches uh, the particular job that we've, we've got. So generally that will be wholesale experience, so experience within our sector. It's generally um, uh, local knowledge experience and, and very often there's a language skill requirement. And because we phone screen um, almost every candidate that fits those, that, that sort of ticks those boxes. Um, it's really a very basic level of information that we're looking for from the CV. I mean, obviously, we're also looking for um, a little bit of a flavour of what the person is, is like from the CV. So a bit of personality helps us at that, at that point. And, of course, a covering letter. Um, and very often people actually don't send in a covering letter, but, uh, but, but something, again, that uh, tells us, gives us some information about um, what they're like and what their motivation is to come to us is really important. And I think the other thing to, to say is, is just looking at the CV itself. Um, so uh, how it's laid out, you know, what thought has been given to the quality of uh, the layout of the CV, uh, making sure that there's no errors, um, it, either in um, grammar or punctuation or, or spelling. Um, because again, those things do give an indication of what, what, what the person is like. So those are the general things that we look for. So it really is a quick skim, followed by a, a more detailed phone screen. Roughly how many people have you interviewed this year? So we've interviewed several hundreds of people, um, and in particular over the last four months have hired just over 100 people. Um, of course, those positions are across a variety of offices, because we have locations um, around the world, and also for a variety of functions, so anywhere from purchasing uh, contractors through salespeople, finance people, a multitude of functions, um, as well as within our head office here in London. Can you explain your interview process? It starts with a phone screen. Uh, so as I said to you before, all candidates will be phone screened. And again, what we're looking for there is kind of confirmation of what the CV says in relation to their experience. So a little bit more in depth around their experience. Uh, but we're also looking for their motivation to, to want to join us. Uh, so we'll ask some very basic questions around what they know about our company and um, why they want to join us. And, and um, frankly, we absolutely expect them to be able to answer that because that goes to the heart of whether actually they really want to work for us. 
Uh, following on from that, assessment will be, there's a, there's a whole kind of variety of different methods that we use from interviews. So an interview, at least one interview will take place. Um, but uh, presentations, case studies, role plays, um, in Romania, we uh, often have an assessment centre type of approach. Um, but a, an example of one of our role plays will be, would be if we were recruiting, for example, a contracts manager. Uh, so we would do a, a role play with a, a, a hotelier. So we would expect um, the candidate to be able to negotiate uh, with a hotelier and we would be able to see a whole kind of raft of different skills that we, we are expecting to see as part of that process. So a range of, a, a range of different things. Um, I think the one thing to say is that at the final stage, at the final interview stage, um, actually what we're really, really looking for is fit. So we want, we want somebody that is really hungry, that is goal-driven, um, that's got really good communication and analytical skills, um, but someone that's very eager to learn and really wants to, to join us. I would just probably add to that and just say that um, in many cases, so many people come in with a lot of the technical skills to do the job, but it's that real cultural fit that we look for, somebody who actually does have, as Elaine said, that drive, that passion, that want to go and be that little bit better than the competitors are, that really does actually make the difference when we decide between candidates as to who we want ultimately. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your induction program for new staff? We obviously have a, a departmental induction that takes place for every new starter, and that's a structured induction um, within the department itself. But we also have a corporate induction program. So every new starter will participate uh, in that particular program. And the way that works, we, we deliver it by a web based talks, obviously we've got people starting all, all, all around the world and every single month uh, there are presentations that are given by the most senior directors uh, within the organisation around a raft of areas, so things like um, the travel landscape and where our company fits within that. Um, our company and what it's like to work at our company, something around the history of our company, our story. Um, the departments and how those departments work and how they interact with each other and how to become a successful new starter when they start uh, at Jack Travel. That's the, the basis of our corporate induction programme. Uh, we also um, have a survey that we send out to new starters about two months after they join uh, to find out how they're, they're getting on. And we look at trends that come out of that survey that tell us, uh, give us some really good information about um, whether there are things that we need to do to improve our induction process. Just to say, I mean, it's a great opportunity not just for the new hires, but also for the senior leadership to actually get to know and engage with the new employees because um, so many times, as Elaine says, you know, we have people based in out, outer um, offices where we don't necessarily get to those offices or they don't necessarily come to the uh, headquarters location. And so um, this is at least an opportunity for us to engage with who the new recruits are what it is that they have on their minds, what brought them to the company. It's a very much of, a, even though it's a presentation from the senior management, it is very much two-way in order for our uh, new recruits to ask any sort of questions that they have. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's actually going on literally as we speak uh, within one of the offices. And I know the presentation that I did yesterday, uh, we had people from the Kentish Town office, people from the Romanian office, we had somebody from Thailand, we had two people from Edinburgh. So. It's, uh, it's, it's a way of bringing everybody together. How costly is it when the recruitment process goes wrong? It, it's hard to quantify exactly what the impact is. I, I mean, what you would be looking at is obviously everything from the burden on the staff who already exist in the company, carrying the weight of the role before the person starts, then they go through the process of training the new recruit to, um, to make sure that they're up to speed, the money to find the recruit, uh, to make sure that uh, we find the right person. Um, and then when they've left, you're basically starting all over again to, um, to end up having to, uh, uh, to find the right person. And so the cost of it, while maybe there is a cost, of course, associated with the recruitment fees as well, um, but there is a real unquantifiable uh, impact to those people around, whether it be the hiring manager or the fellow employees, um, or it could be even be your customer or a supplier whose you know, payment is delayed uh, to receive. 
um, or uh, who is not getting the sort of support that they require. So there's so many different ways in which you can feel the impact of not recruiting well. And the managers, of course. Um, I mean, it's incredibly frustrating for them when somebody leaves. Um, and the impact on them is enormous because obviously it's their time then to, to rehire the person. What do you believe makes staff happy? And what initiative do you offer to address staff motivation? Well, I, I think there are the obvious benefits that, um, uh, that, that many companies offer. Um, so around holiday allowances, pensions, uh, private medical insurance, etc. Um, uh, there are other things that go well beyond that, particularly um, in helping, um, uh, th you know, things like uh, having a good work-life balance, like flexible working. And we have a put your feet up on your birthday day, so we give everybody their birthdays off. Um, I think beyond that, um, you know, people come to us because uh, they like the fact that we're a very entrepreneurial, fast-paced company, really on a, on a big growth trajectory. And they know by the time that they come to us, actually, that they're here to make a difference. And so for us, their, their development and their career, um, the, the opportunities that we're able to create for them in terms of their career is really, really important for us. So that, um, that uh, career path is some, something we take really seriously. We talk to them about that. We also have a dedicated training manager um, and um, she um, looks generally um, from conversations with managers, but also as part of the appraisal process at looking at personal development plans and seeing what type of training we need to uh, um, organize in a more formal sense to help people's uh, careers develop and help them their, their own sort of skill sets to develop. So things, so there's a whole raft of business skills training that, that we offer and you will have seen as you came in, in the door, on the door, uh, the training that uh, we still got to just a few places left on. So it could be anything from negotiation skills to communication skills to Excel training to um, a, a, really a whole range of, of, of different things. Aside from that, um, it's really important, um, we feel, to train our managers to become prof professional managers. Um, and we do that by offering a range of different programs. So from team leaders, we offer a team leader program to an introduction to management program to a management the fundamentals program, um, all aimed at helping people to grow and develop in their roles as, as, as people managers, essentially. Uh, we offer those people the opportunity to take the Institute of um, Leadership and Management qualifications and we've had, well, at least 20 people go through and pass qualifications at di very di various different levels uh, within that particular programme, which is great. We also do something a little bit more informal than that. So um, in our um, uh, main offices every single month, we have something called Manager Light Bites. So this is where we invite all our line managers or anybody that would like to attend for lunch, generally over a sandwich and a bag of crisps, um, to really talk about a particular area of management. So it, ca it could be around um, how you manage performance, it could be around one-to-one -one meetings, it, it could be around managing people remotely, all the kind of things that actually are challenging for managers. And it's about sharing uh, best practice uh, between, uh, between each other. And it's also about gaining some, some hints and, and tips. So uh, those are the areas that are really important in terms of, of, of management development. I think possibly the other thing to say is, is we have a, a lovely reward and recognition programme. So this is the opportunity to say thank you to people um, as a way of you know, helping to motivate them because we recognise that you know, the job is demanding. It's very, very busy environment. Um, and so we have a quarterly uh, reward and recognition programme where um, anybody can nominate um, one of their colleagues or a manager can nominate a colleague for a, for a reward for going the extra mile. Uh, the, uh, a panel of members of the board then judge those, um, uh, those nominations and, and every quarter there are rewards. And at the end of the year we have a ceremony and uh, there are obvious winners, so we, we celebrate that. And actually last year, we sent uh, the winner to Dubai for a week. So that was a really nice thing to do. How do you value the environment as a retention or attraction tool? 
Yeah, I think it's really it's really important. I mean, as you can see from these offices, as you as you come in, it's light and airy. It's very 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 open. Um, we showed you our kitchen, so this is the sort of hub of the the office where everybody mills around at uh, at lunchtime and just enjoys each other's company and and uh, and something to eat. And I think you get it. You know, you do get a sense of a, a warm, friendly environment from the office, and I think that is really important. And and that of course, goes for our, our other offices. So in Romania, for example, um, we've got a, a, a lovely uh, big office where everybody is all on one floor in, in a town called Tagamoresh, and there's beams everywhere, and it's a, it is a very welcoming environment. Yeah, I guess I would just add to that that, um, you know, we also want to make sure that there is the ability to have private confidential conversations as well. So we ensure that there is amount of airiness, openness, so that people do feel very um, uh, mot motivated to collaborate with those around them. But equally, it's important sometimes to actually break away and have a bit of space to just think or to meet with one of your colleagues, um, have confidential conversations. So there is that balance um, that we try to get right. And it does feel like we've been able to strike the right chord in these offices here, and we've tried to carry that through the other offices that we have globally. 